This paper has been co-authored by ICRIR, the Indian Council for Research and International Economic Relations, and PLR Chambers. It would be my pleasure to now invite Dr. Deepak Mishra to give the welcome address. Dr. Mishra is the Director and Chief Executive at ICRIR, and prior to ICRIR, he has held various positions at the World Bank. Dr. Mishra, if you could please give us the welcome address. Thank you, Preksha. Very good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the webinar and the release of the jointly produced report by ICRIR and PLR Chamber on developing principles for regulation and pricing of alcoholic beverages sector in India. Um, as Raksha mentioned, I'm new to the job, so a bit of a self-introduction is in order. My name is Deepak Mishra. I'm an economist by training. I joined ICRIR as its director and chief executive on July 1, so pretty much three weeks into the job. And it gives me real pleasure to participate in this webinar uh, which brings together two very important research topics, you know, ease of doing business and tax policy, both at the national and subnational level. But before I get to the report, uh, let's talk about a few facts about the alcoholic beverage sector. Truth be told, there are nearly 300 million Indians who consume alcohol every year, and this number is expected to rise to close to 400 million by 2030. The sector accounts for 1.5 million jobs, generate nearly $50 billion of sales, and the market is growing close to 7% or more. The sector contributes nearly 75% to 90%, 99% of states' revenue once you exclude the petroleum products. Yet, by global standard, India is a small market, tiny market. 0.27% of global export and 0.75% of global imports originate in India. So that tells you how tiny we are, but also tells you there are significant economic gains in terms of growth, jobs, and fiscal revenue that could come by reforming the sector. The reports find that the cost of doing business in the alcoholic beverage sector is perhaps one of the highest in the world, with wide divergence in transparency, predictability, and clarity in tax policy and regulatory regime across Indian states, we have 30 heterogeneous markets for the sector instead of a single market. Imagine the benefit that we could get by harmonizing the rules and the regulations and the tax policies. The report prepared by the research team from ICRIA and PLR chambers is a first of its kind report that attempts to develop transparent principles for regulation and pricing of alcoholic beverage sector, which can provide the basis for designing policies and pricing models at different states. It brings together good practices from home and from abroad to make useful and practical policy recommendations. This is the first phase of the study. The next phase will explore the requirements and concerns of different states and help them to customize the model to the needs. Given the work is ongoing, the researchers look forward to your inputs and suggestions so that we can improve the quality of the next phase of our work. I'm delighted at the close collaboration between the two teams from ICRIA and PLR Chambers. This is first uh, joint project for us, and I'm looking forward to more collaboration in the future. I'm most excited about the esteemed panelists we have today. I'm grateful to uh, Ms. Kapoor, Mr. Yadav, Dr. Mandal, Mr. Giri, Mr. Rai, for agreeing to join us uh, today morning, or today afternoon, sorry. We are keen to hear your views and suggestions, and I am very much looking forward for Arpita, Aditya, and the team to take notes, you know, receive all the feedback so that we can incorporate them in the second phase of the work. In closing remarks, let me just turn back to the report again. Uh, alcohol may be a taboo subject for some Indians, but from a pure economic perspective, it presents a great opportunity. Reforming the sector can have triple winners, consumers who could pay less, producers who could sell more, 
and government which could collect more revenue. This, of course, needs to be thought through carefully, including consumers' education for responsible drinking. With that, let me once again welcome you all to the webinar and the release of the jointly prepared report by ICREA and PLR General. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for your words. I would now request the chairman of ICREA, Mr. Pramod Bhaseen, to kindly launch the report. Mr. Bhaseen needs no introduction at all. He was the president and CEO of GE Capital in India and Asia. He is considered the founder and pioneer of business process industry in the country. Mr. Bhaseen, I invite you to please launch the report. May I please request all dignitaries and my co-authors to switch on their cameras and hold a copy of the report for the release. Thank you, Preksha. Thank you very much. And a warm welcome from me to every one of you panelists, the authors of the report, all the people who have joined us on this wonderful webinar on a topic that is so topical, as well as perhaps in many respects, a topic that is not discussed as often as it needs, as it deserves to be. It gives me great pleasure to release this joint ICREA and PLR report on developing principles for regulation and pricing of alcoholic beverages sector in India. I do want to compliment the research team on the work they have done on this complex issue. Um, it is complex because it is a state subject. It is uh, managed by the states. I mean, it, it's subject to uh, so much regulation at each individual state. And yet, uh, at a time when the states are facing a huge financial pressure due to COVID, uh, it becomes very important for them as very often, as Deepak had said, one of the single largest sources of revenues that they have. So my congratulations to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be able to release the report. I'll just add a few more comments to what Deepak has already said, and I'm sure the panelists will be able to add a lot more. It is interesting that alcoholic re uh, revenue remains a top uh, revenue earning sector of the state governments. They have to balance multiple objectives, between health, revenue generation, but globally, many, many countries do have price controls of a variety of different kinds. But in India, unfortunately, there is a massive variation state by state and a lack perhaps of transparency, complexity, the timeliness of uh, permissions being granted, uh, of different policies and licensing arrangements all of which create a significant issue in terms of its manufacture, distribution, and subsequent sale, as well as revenue collection and the entire pricing mechanism that would be involved. One of the areas where I believe India could thrive if we could make this easier, and that is beyond the state subject itself, perhaps, but it requires both the central and state level help, would be in fact that India, I wish one day would become an exporter of these alcoholic beverages. It is not a subject that is discussed very often, despite being the largest revenue earner for so many different states. And yet the opportunity for India as we think about the future, and it's not something that this report talks about, but it is something that I've thought about as we think about exporting from India and growing and uh, make, building different manufacturing cap capabilities in India. It is the ability of India to produce alcoholic beverages and export them, which in itself could have been a very major opportunity. My belief has been that in the past, this has not been really possible because of the myriad of regulation and complexities that have, that have uh, engulfed us. I do agree with the central core of the report's recommendation that state excise departments would, could benefit enormously by switching to online systems for registration, licensing, and permits. Digitization can help in better and transparent monitoring of the entire revenue collection process. Data analytics can help us. Technology-based solutions can help us. And we need to adopt all of these to introduce transparency. And also, by the way, stop the leakages that inevitably happen in a system which is not as transparent and which passes through many different hands in the process of ultimately reaching the consumers. 
you could also have innovative startups coming into this area, which could also lead with some pilot projects to make this very effective. The problem becomes that in India, as Deepak also mentioned, we have 30 heterogeneous markets for alcoholic beverages instead of a single market. It is a state subject, of course, and we have to respect that, and that is the way it will work. And therefore, having a standardized or a foundational system for establishing prices across every state, which is what the core recommendation of this report is, would make eminent sense. I hope we can work with the state governments. I hope we can listen to all the discussions here. I hope we can look at the recommendations and the points that the panelists will make and take them forward. We play and try and play a key role in policy making at ICRIA. We partner very well with many different organizations, in this case with PLR Chambers, for this report. I hope we can do many more collaboration and joint research projects, and I hope we can engage with policymakers and experts to take their feedback. Alcoholic beverages will remain, I think, in our country, a subject that is not discussed as often, perhaps, as it should be given the size of the industry, and yet will also remain a very, very strong revenue producer for every state in the foreseeable future. It deserves this kind of report and this kind of research and this kind of data-driven analytics that the team has pulled together. Thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to be able to host this. It's a pleasure to be able to release the report. And now back to you uh, to carry on with the rest of this webinar, Preksha. Back to you. Thank you, sir. So as just a part of this virtual launch, I would really request all the panelists here, all the dignitaries here to just lift up the report once and just hold it up to just signify the launch. I don't have a copy. I mean, I'm very it. far away, so I don't have a copy of it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on, I would now like to invite the co-authors of this report, Dr. Arpita Mukherjee, the professor at Ikshir, and Mr. Aditya Prakash Rao, partner PLR Chambers, to present the key findings of the report. Dr. Mukherjee, if you could please start. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I hope you have the screen share and the presentation with you, Priksha. Yes, I will just share it. Yeah, please. Uh, good afternoon. While, while the screen is being set, let me give you a brief introduction. The whole uh, story began with uh, when Suhan and Aditya actually came to meet me in Ikriyar to look into this uh, sector of the regulation and price uh, uh, changes uh, and uh, to look into uh, the state level variations. Uh, Given that, you know, we have so many states, we decided to actually focus on a few states and uh, and also to identify the states which have some similarities and some differences. So we have covered 10 states in the report and, uh, and we will be, uh, 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 we will like to cover all the other states in the next phase. Riksha, are you having any problem? Should I do it at my end? No, I'm just going to share it. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, we based this study on two or three core areas, like we did a lot of study of the state government policies and documentations because we had a good legal team to help us to study them. And then we went into a survey and detailed uh, discussions with companies, their supply chain agents, and these companies are both foreign companies and Indian companies. So just to move into the next slide of the uh, presentation directly. So Basically, India today is a fast growing market. It is, it is growing at almost the double the rate at a 6% where the global market is growing around 3.5%. Uh, so it is almost a double the growth and this growth rate also is during the COVID time. So we look into that and it this sector is a major employer because a lot of sourcing for alcoholic beverages happens in India. Like it will need grain, it will need uh, grapes for wine. So therefore, things 
are being locally sourced things are being locally manufactured and the consumers are increasing and consumers are changing their drinking patterns so they are now moving some of them are moving from uh, only whiskey which is still the largest to beer and wine and uh, trying out other formats of drinks as well so next slide please uh, so uh, preksha next slide please so the having said that what we wanted to see is that alcoholic beverage taxation is not new to the global context in globally that is very well studied because it helps uh, countries and within the country states or region to design their policies like uh, scotland has a very strong model where it looks at purchase behavior and production behavior to design the tax system and globally there is also a concept which uh, says that previously who and others used to promote a concept that if you tax a product which is uh, and you can reduce consumption but that doesn't help for many products like alcoholic beverage you can tax the person can go to lower quality consumption that can have uh, impact on health uh, or you can tax yet the person can reduce the consumption of other things and continue on this so there is a price elasticity at play and then you have to match the consumer with the price elasticity to come to a complex model of a demand and supply focusing on india specifically that kind of model doesn't exist because we don't have state level demand data state level supply data and therefore often the pricing models have become a little difficult and because the excise are not able to get the data they try to control the entire supply chains with certain objectives in mind and these objectives can vary from a complete plan of liquor in one state like we are to something like you know you are allowed to do a home delivery so there are variations having said that quasi federal systems can have, have variations so our aim was to develop principles for regulations and taxations that will help the state government to meet their objectives and each can have their different objectives and priorities but can come to a data driven policy making now when you look at the data today as it stand you will see that the revenue by product category varies across states some part of it is because of the consumption but if you look at haryana you will be a little shocked to see uh, that you know the majority of the revenue is coming from country liquor this is because not because uh, the data is wrong this is because haryana takes 80% of the revenue even before uh, the the liquor approaches the market it is from the vent sale next uh, next slide please so uh, this slide what we try to do is to actually show about the process the process uh, how the lead time of the process how the process itself vary between uh, you know in some state it is manual but it is faster in others it is online but it is slow so the variations are not always related to, to being manual or technology but i think where the technology helps is to create a database and that database helps you to churn out uh, you know information now if you look into pricing models there is one pricing model that is free pricing free pricing is something which the industry often likes to go for uh, rather than there are other pricing models where the state government asks the industry only to get the prices of the neighboring states and then the pricing model can change as has been the case of delhi next slide please so Uh, having said that uh, there are other other bigger variations which are starkly because in india mrp maximum retail price minimum retail price should actually be a central legislation but here the each states will call these terms in a different way so it interpretation languages because they are in local languages but language is not a big issue because in european union also you have so many different languages the problem happens when the calculation method across neighboring states lead to different pricing and when there is a different pricing there are leakages um, i would also like to bring to your notice is that this is a very important from a revenue earning perspective of the states and and post covid a number of cess has been imposed even before that when kerala went into the natural disaster there was a cess imposed so this this sector contributes to the revenue but often cess like in case of delhi we have given an example when 70% cess was imposed actually the revenue went down so we have to find a way where the cess actually doesn't uh, lead to some drawback in the revenue earning and 
what we see here is that most states are now trying to actually extract much of the revenue given that the gst doesn't allow them much other areas to raise their revenue so having said that i we move to the next slide and i give it to my co-author aditya to continue thank you dr arpita for walking us through the current and future outlook of the sector the objectives and methodology adopted by the team while drafting this report as well as the nuanced but critical variations in state's approach to alcohol regulation and pricing that has a long term impact uh moving on uh, our research survey and interactions uh with the stated aim of developing principles for regulation and taxation for the sector uh, revealed a commonality amongst all the states under review in the form of uh, key issues or barriers if you may uh that tend to have a detrimental effect on all stakeholders uh and by this uh, i would mean the uh, public sector which is the the government or the distribution arm uh, you're looking at the consumers uh, as well as the manufacturers and the larger uh, trade ecosystem in part 4 of the report we have attempted to categorize these into regulatory barriers and those that relate to price control uh starting right from the modern manner of categorization as dr arpita was referring of products uh to the method of regulation administration of price control in the manner that it applies itself and the overall framework uh it it is not only heterogeneous but it's kind or more often remains unpredictable and bereft with ad hoc changes um it's also underpinned with the lack of appropriate use of technology or data to drive this decision making uh the team also observed uh, in this process that the policies were not reviewed for years or had no mechanism for inflationary price adjustment or request for these increases uh when made under the appropriate framework uh were not heeded to for a considerable amount of time uh while these issues may come across through variations in the report the net result of these uh not surprisingly um is largely uniform as a consistent pattern uh ad hoc changes to policies or increase in taxes uh have resulted uh in in most uh cases lower recoveries for the state and and perhaps even driving uh consumption to a lower band or segments of alcohol uh the practice of requesting lowest edp either on a nationwide basis or from neighboring states also uh has not given the enthusing response to the exchequer's wallet uh as was being expected uh the other attendant result of these issues uh, persisting is that illicit trade uh gets a fillip in in certain areas uh where there is a great amount of differential between uh the taxes being imposed in a particular state and the neighboring states uh lack of investments by manufacturers due to increasing compliance and uh predictability uh potential impact on consumer health and the muted ability uh to participate in the global supply chain uh next slide please uh the report aims to make very uh, pointed five observations or recommendations if you may and uh, they are more or less intertwined with each other uh, what we are really looking for and recommend is that uh, clear and predictable policies uh, be adopted uh, there should be mechanisms for review a timely review a periodical review in close consultation with the industry uh point 2 and 3 uh actually relate to data driven uh, recommendations coming in uh, looking at the appropriate technology interventions and there are states who in various facets be it uh, allocation of license be it looking at ingestion of data have actually adopted uh, technology measures so these exist uh today it's a question of assimilating them uh, and and sort of deploying them on the overall and uh, lastly uh, looked at phase tariff reduction and export potential uh, as you try to move towards a, a single market next slide please uh in terms of the next steps i would echo uh, what dr mishra uh, and mr basian said is that the authors of the report uh, would invite uh, states to peruse these recommendations we'd be glad to work with their teams uh, to assimilate data models for arriving at the optimum regulatory market distribution and pricing control model while preserving the nuanced and state centric policy goals thank you very much thank you dr mukherjee and thank you mr rao 
for the detailed presentation on the key findings of the report. Moving on to the panel discussion now, which is on doing business in India, regulation and pricing of alcoholic beverages. To conduct this particular panel discussion, we have eminent panelists today here with us. Our panelists here today are policy makers, acad academicians, and industry representatives who will discuss on conducting business in the alcohol industry and the existing regulatory and pricing barriers which exist in the ecosystem. They will also highlight the reforms that may be formulated and their points of view on the same. Introducing the panelists today, we have Dr. Ms. Neeta Kapoor, the CEO of ISWAI, that is the International Spirits and Wines Association of India. Ms. Kapoor has worked for 30 plus years in varying positions in the leadership roles across the corporate sector. We also have Mr. Rajiv Mehershi, who we all know is the former Comptroller and Auditor General of India. He was also Home Secretary in 2015. Before his appointment as the Home Secretary, he worked as the Economic Affairs Secretary and Chief Secretary of Rajasthan. He has also served as the Deputy Secretary and Principal Secretary of the Finance Ministry for the State of Rajasthan. Our next panelist is Mr. Sudittu Mandri. Sir is the Senior Advisor at the National Council of Applied Economic Research and previously a professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, New Delhi. He was also a member of the erstwhile 14th Finance Commission and the Monetary Policy Advisory Committee of the RBI and the National Statistical Commission where he also acted as chairman. Last but not the least, we have Mr. Vinod Giri, who is the Director General of the Confederation of Indian Alcohol Alcoholic Beverage Companies. Mr. Giri has an experience of more than 20 years in sales, marketing and management roles in India and globally. He is presently the Director General at CIABC, as I have mentioned, and he is also associated with the Federation of Alcoholic Beverage Producers. Thank you so much, all the eminent panelists for joining us today. We have Mr. Suhan Mukherjee, the managing partner of PLR Chambers, who will be moderating today's panel discussion. Prior to setting up PLR Chambers, Mr. Mukherjee led a, pol a practice in policy and regulatory affairs at Amarchand Mangaldas. And he has an overall experience of more than 20 years in legislative drafting, policy formulation, and legal advisory. I would now request Mr. Suhan Mukherjee to commence the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Preksha, for that uh, introduction. Uh, the format of the panel uh, discussion uh, would be that uh, each of the panelists uh, set uh, forth uh, their opening remarks, uh, and thereafter we uh, uh, open up for a few uh, questions and uh, discussions, and then closing remarks uh, by the panelists. Uh, I'd like to actually invite uh, Mr. Maharishi to uh, open the discussions uh, with uh, his comments uh, and uh, thereafter followed by Dr. Mandal, Ms. Neeta Kapoor and uh, then Mr. Vinod Kiri. Uh, Mr. Maharishi, so please. Yeah. Thank you, Swan. I might not be here for the closing remarks, so I'll try to say in brief what I need to say. Uh, to begin with, you know, I have not really been able to read the report because I haven't got the hard copy. The soft copy came to me, but with my age and my generation, it's not easy for us to sit and report, read a report on the machine. It strains our eyes. So uh, I've read parts of it. I've glanced through it. Uh, second thing is, you know, that one uh, issue I have with the, I have several issues with the report, and one of the issues with the report is that uh, uh, no practitioner in the field has seems to have been consulted. So to that extent, it might it has the danger of uh, being reduced to a mere academic work, because between theory and practice, 
there is actually a huge gap. So understanding the dynamics of this trade is also very, very important and how it you know, leads to various complications is also very important to understand. So I'm, uh, well, I've been a practitioner. Uh, I've actually handled the subject in the state for about a decade or various, various periods of time. And uh, so I would actually, uh, as a practitioner, my first question that arises in my mind, and I wish that uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, PLR, PLR Chambers had answered it at the beginning, that who's driving this study? Who's paying for it? Who are the clients who have approached that this study be done? So if, I'm not asking for any client confidentiality and I don't care if you answer that question or not. It's a question that occurs to me as a practitioner. Now, uh, with the report itself, I just had to point out two uh, issues. One is that uh, flag B says, and in his opening remarks from Mr. Basin also mentioned it, that 70 to 90% of the revenues of the state come from excise. That's not true. That's simply not true. So as a matter of fact, uh, 60 to 65% or 70% of the state's revenues come, come from what is originally sales tax, then became VAT and now has become GST. So when I was principal secretary of finance, the broad magnitude of figures was about a thousand crores from, or 200 crores from excise and about 6,000 crores from sales tax or VAT. So really speaking, uh, the contribution of excise revenues to the total of state's own revenues, not counting transfers from the center, uh, is about 20% or maybe a little less than that. Secondly, uh, you know, on the wine graph, you know, while uh, it may look very sort of flat on the graph itself, but if there's an increase from 0.42% to 0.5%, it is not insignificant. It's an increase of 20%. So I don't think it can be dismissed as an insignificant. It's an insignificant market is yet in India, but the increase in the wine market itself is significant because compared to the base, it's an increase of 20%. So the authors might like to look at these two things. It would be basically incorrect to say that 90% of revenue states' own revenues come from uh, excise. Now, I, I, I will, you know, concentrate on telling you uh, what I know as uh, being part of the practitioners group, that basically, uh, other than the consumer, who actually is a major stakeholder, and he's the least sort of consulted or the least bothered about, and it can be quite unfortunate to be an alcohol a consumer in any state. So uh, sometimes it makes it so difficult, it's an embarrassment to even buy a bottle of liquor, you may have to stand in long lines and queues and such like. And so it's, it's, it's the consumer is not taken into account when excise policies are laid out. But the other stakeholders, uh, uh, government of course is obviously a stakeholder because it has a huge revenue interest. But other stakeholders are actually uh, the contractors uh, who sometimes get areas to control and who sometimes get individual shops to control. Uh, there are, so they are the distributors or wholesalers and they've used their positions at times to really exploit and pressurize the manufacturers. So we are aware of the time when groups were being auctioned. And at that time, uh, since uh, if I were a contractor and I had to say who could sell uh, in Rajasthan and who could not, then really I could pressurize the uh, manufacturer to give me the, uh, the terms and conditions that uh, uh, I sort of desired, which is why in some states, if we have had the uh, unfortunate uh, sort of experience on not finding the brand that you want of beer or wine or, or whiskey, it is probably because that, that area's contractor is not allowing that brand to be sold in his area. Uh, the other major stakeholder is, uh, is are the manufacturers, and uh, I would classify them as two. Uh, one is the Indian manufacturers, and the other are the multinational companies now that have come into and taken over, say, UB beverages, etc. Now, uh, in Rajasthan, in, in northern India, traditionally, this trade has conducted this whole trade, including actually at one stage, 100 years back, 50 years back, 
including of distributing uh, local liquor, was done by a particular community. Now let's call this community community A. You know, and this community was obviously very rich because you know they controlled liquor trade in in, in northern Indian states at least. I don't know about South India. And uh, everybody wanted to interact with them for purposes of funding or bribe taking, etc. But nobody wanted to be socializing with them because they were seen as being, you know, a, 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 a sort of in a trade which was not really uh, seen as a, a respectable trade. And in many ways, uh, at that level, it is a trade, at least in India, which actually uh, borders on crime. So the two get interrelated. So smuggling is a very, very common thing. So I can challenge, I can say with confidence sitting here, though I've been out of the out of government for a long time, out of this department for a long time now, I can say with confidence that if you look at the figures, then uh, uh, one or two states surrounding, or maybe all the states surrounding Bihar would have seen a spike in their excise revenues uh, from the time that Bihar became dry. So smuggling is a huge issue. Uh, it also, even when the neighboring states are not dry, uh, states have to fine tune their excise policy to prevent smuggling. So if I put my excise duty at a level which is very high, then naturally smuggling will take place from Haryana or Punjab or Delhi into my state. So states also have to fine tune their excise policies to figure out the best way that they can prevent smuggling. The uh, Third, uh, the other stakeholder is the uh, the sort of illegal beneficiary of uh, excise policies and laws. You know, excise policies not only differ from state to state, they differ and change from year to year. I would, uh, if I had the money, I would never ever invest a single rupee in, in putting up a, or investing in a, uh, in a alcoholic manufacturing unit. Well, I really don't know whether I'll be able to sell in that state or not. So whether I have a bottling plant or a distillery or a brewery, really I'm completely at the mercy of, a, of, of not only 30 state policies, but of policies which may change from year to year. Uh, the other, as I said, the other stakeholders are therefore the manufacturers. And when I look at this trade, when I look back at this trade, uh, I find that None of these stakeholders, whether it's the distributors, the contractors, uh, whether it's the Indian manufacturers, whether it's the multinationals, are any cleaner or any better to deal with than the original community that they are liquor. So they are as their practices are as unhealthy and as below the uh, sort of uh, law as anybody else is. And I can give you a classic example of this. Uh, that uh, when I was Special Secretary of Finance Rajasthan, a uh, major multinational, one of the biggest in the world, approached me and said, we have four distributors of our whiskey uh, uh, in, in Delhi, in North, in North India, and why don't you ask your hoteliers to buy, uh, buy their liquor, their whiskey, only from a designated one of those four manufacturers. Now, that obviously was, uh, is something that is simply not acceptable. So uh, none of these people are, uh, you know, uh, people that frankly I am I'm in love with, or I can trust, or I can, you know, uh, uh, I would like to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. They have, uh, you know, uh, this whole issue of pricing, for example, you know, it's very complex in the state because, uh, partly for reasons of corruption, partly for reasons of competition. Uh, but at the same time, the uh, price increase asked for by the manufacturers repeatedly, which is what is really hurting them right now, because states seem to have all ganged up to keep price at a certain level, uh, doesn't seem to have, you know, they keep claiming that inflation needs to be taken into account to sort of uh, uh, offset our increasing cost. But really, none of these manufacturers seem to have uh, been hurt on their bottom lines even with the prices being more or less constant for the last uh, uh, couple of years, maybe five or six years. So, uh, uh, so we have to understand that uh, this is not everybody involved in this trade sort of uh, is, has got a side to him or her 
which is uh, not very palatable or very sort of uh, attractive. And this includes policymakers like me, you know. So a lot of us uh, uh, are into the game of taking bribes and, you know, settling uh, issues on basis of money, etc. So uh, it's uh, policymakers are equally to blame, but nobody in this game is blameless. And uh, the kind of dirty practices that go on, including in branding, you know, you, you uh, essentially seem the same liquor, sell the same liquor, but you uh, brand it uh, with a slightly different name, you know, uh, X, X whiskey, X whiskey, X deluxe whiskey, X ordinary whiskey, and you price it differently because you want to hit a different excise band. All right. So all kind of, you know, uh, sort of subterranean practice go on like this. And uh, 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 the uh, uh, trade is very difficult to understand. So to that extent, the only point I'm trying to make uh, is that uh, to hope that there would be a all India policy is a hope that I know a lot of manufacturers really harbor. It's not likely to happen for a variety of reasons. One is that this is a state subject and no state is going to give this up. GST, they gave up more easily uh, uh, and with reluctance, but a little more easily than this, because in GST, they were all going to gain. And GST, the corruption levels are not so high. Because there was no, you know, this problem with excise is that there is one identified product on which a huge amount of money rides. If you look at sales tax, etc., there is no one product with such a huge amount of money rise, uh, rides, except perhaps petroleum, but that's, you know, you can't do much corruption there. So therefore, uh, uh, it's not likely to happen. And to that extent, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, a, a study like this would remain in the realm of being a little theoretical uh, unless we uh, understand the whole dynamics of this trade, how people function, what are their, you know, what are the interests of each of the stakeholders and how uh, those uh, concerns can either be addressed or those tendencies can be minimized. You know, and uh, so I would refer the authors, for example, to uh, uh, CAG's report uh, on UP's excise policy. I think it's a 2019 or 2020 report. I released it before I left office. You know, it, that, if you read that report, nobody reacted to it. But if you read that report, to my mind, it's one of the biggest scams in India. So what happened in UP for 15 years in, in terms of excise policy was actually a scam to, uh, to sort of help uh, one particular contractor, you know, and the sums involved are humongous, you know, and uh, one didn't want to sensationalize, sensationalize the whole issue, but therefore one gave only an example of it, of the kind of uh, multiples involved uh, in that entire, uh, uh, this thing. But you see the, uh, you, you see the kind of uh, uh, togetherness of everybody including the current government, which has actually changed the policy to a more sensible policy, much more sensible policy, that really there's been no noise on that report, which is, you know, I find absolutely astonishing because that report uh, uh, very clearly brought out that uh, what, what happened in UP 15 years was really amazing. So uh, my only suggestion to the group and to agree is that uh, uh, basically, uh, I think we need to talk to a few more practitioners and people involved in the trade to really understand uh, what, uh, you know, uh, sort of drive this trade and what ails it in India. And it's not only in India that I, I used a very strong phrase saying it's, it's a trade which borders on crime, uh, but it's, it's true internationally, really speaking. And, you know, it was the prohibition in USA 1930, which gave us the mafia. So it's really, it's really uh, a trade of which breeds that kind of uh, uh, tendency uh, in, uh, in it. Also comparing uh, policy, Indian policy with UK policy is a bit unfair because you know, UK is more or less a unitary state. It doesn't have you know, state-wise policies. But if you look at USA, for example, and I must be honest, I have not studied it in detail, but I'm aware of some basic facts uh, or look at Canada, you know, there the policies and taxation rates are quite different from state to state. 
you know and uh, they, uh, they matlab it, it's not so transparent to us uh but uh, i know for a fact that if you look at uh, the us uh, the, uh, the the policies and the taxation rates in the us states and parts of canada you find that there are whole variations amongst the states states within that uh, country so that is uh, all that i have to say i i, I beg forgiveness uh, for being uh, blunt and for being harsh uh, but uh, uh, i intend to hurt nobody i intend to call nobody names but that is the experience that i had uh, uh, you know when i was about the one of the most distressful jobs unfortunately i had to do it for 10 years uh, that i did in my life was to actually deal with excise policy <laughs> uh thank you mr maharishi uh, uh, i'll just quickly respond to you because uh, i i know you have to leave at 4:30 uh, given uh, your opening remarks uh how do we actually incentivize a shift uh, in bringing transparency into the into this sector because that's the objective of the study and it's actually an un- completely an untied uh, grant in that sense because as policy makers we were keen to look at how do you bring transparency to the sector and in fact we took guidance from the cag report that you're referring to uh, and it's referred within this uh, report uh, as well as the examples of the united states uh given that the state is so omnipresent in uh in this sector uh in, how do we incentivize uh the state to act in a manner such that uh we organize this and shift the needle away from what you said borders on illegality uh in many cases uh comprehensively in various states and the objective of the study was to do that so uh, i wish i could answer that question so on i really wish i could but as i said uh, the money involved uh, especially the illegally money illegal money involved in the trade is such that that's going to be a real challenge it, it probably happen over a period of time uh, as uh, you know there are compulsions of revenue and demands of you know uh, of the system to be more transparent after all this, this you know this is a democracy and people would demand it but it's a bit of a challenge it's a huge challenge because uh, of the you know uh, as i said because of the uh, uh, corruption involved in uh, both uh, making and uh, implementing the excise policies in the states okay uh, so then uh, do you believe actually uh, if the as the study recommends that we are looking at models to create objective criteria to at least set policy as far as excise policy is concerned uh, we should be driving towards that so that discretion is removed as far as possible from the system uh, given the fact that different states follow different models but the more we can take them to objective criteria and formulate uh, w- would that be a better alternative uh, so we can try and uh, you know um, you know uh, having objective criteria is the dream of uh, you know people like me for everything but you know again in the issue is that uh, why is it uh, you know it's it is in a sense you are right as a leadership uh, as as a leader uh, uh, government should really be very transparent but nobody else in the system is transparent either i give you the example of this big multinational and its demands that we buy scotch only from uh, uh, one man, one of the, one of his stockists now we know what is going on there exactly i don't want to spell it out but i know exactly what is going on there and believe me that uh, there is there there is there is a, a sort of a, a wrong doing on part of the part of the company as whole and wrong doing on part of its employees privately okay so i mean I, i'll just sum it up in what you're saying is we of course require structural reform uh, at all levels from all stakeholders uh, in this sector and uh, would look at this report essentially for us uh, as researchers both at icria and at plr was uh, how do we take that first step because this is uh, uh, why we've looked at this as two phases and this is just the beginning of the work that we're supposed to do and we look forward to taking guidance from uh, people like yourselves and actually that excellent report you wrote um at the cag uh, 
in guiding how this sector needs to be developed and uh, with that i'd like to uh, actually uh, bring in uh, dr mandal uh, you know somebody who's been an economic planner uh, uh, both uh, here in india as well as uh, internationally and uh, would like you to uh, in your remarks uh, uh, touch upon how do we feel we could actually uh, bring india into the framework of becoming part of a global supply chain or a manufacturing framework if at all for this sector and to grow it out uh, uh, given the fact that we don't really figure much in the export market at all uh, that's one uh, macro uh, uh, objective but in order to do that do we need to change things internally within the country in the way policies set at different states uh and what should be the indicators or incentives that can be created by uh states to bring transparency and discipline uh, into the sector so it can go from strength to strength uh thank you suan and first of all i want i will address your question but first of all i do want to thank <clears throat> both plr and ikria for inviting me to this panel discussion on what i think is a very very timely and uh, important uh, report because there is no question that one of the biggest distortions among others with our gst system is the exclusion of alcohol along with petroleum from the coverage of gst and of course we know there are lots of uh, interests of the states and so on I'll, i'll come to that in a minute but that is why it is very timely and i suppose the purpose of reports of this kind is uh, not simply to to make proposals which are acceptable to a b c d states but have a benchmark of where you would like to go ultimately It may not happen today but eventually and with that in view gradually nudge the needle in the in in, in the right uh, direction and there are many useful findings in in this report that will be reported but this is work in progress as you say so instead of just saying this is a great report i uh, like mr mashi i want to draw attention to a few issues uh, that i noticed uh, mainly you know with the purpose of a provoking a discussion and uh, as the work proceeds to to get uh, uh, some improvement first of all on the methodological question you know i noticed in the discussion that it referred to a a uh, survey and i found that quite intriguing and it's a survey done between march and september now march and september uh, 2020 uh, the national sample survey organization and other major field survey organizations like the national council of applied research research that i am associated with suspended all field surveys simply because it was not practical and feasible because of covid so i was quite intrigued by this and then when i probed a little further i found that actually 80 persons had been uh, uh, had been met and discussed with now that you can call it a survey but that really is a consultation process and the major stakeholder excluded from this was the consumer and when we talk about surveys of this kind it says the consumer should be a major focus of such surveys if you need a series about calling them surveys and not consultations with uh, you know basically it's consider with regulators and the business whether it's the manufacturer or the distributor or retailer and so on so uh, uh, that's just uh, uh, one uh, one thing i noticed and going forward you have a second phase you might actually like to consider doing a proper uh, survey so those tend to be quite uh, expensive the other thing that intrigued me is an observation as a there's a diagram referring to that that alcohol accounts for 90% of the revenues of the state uh, that was quite shocking to me and 94% 99% some states 77 somewhere else and then i realized that there's a little remark over there saying this excludes uh, petroleum now you know in the post gst era it is petroleum and uh, alcohol which are the two major sources of, of revenue for the states and so uh, one needs to do a little bit of hygiene in these things and you know be i mean the report also needs to be transparent in this 
rather than, you know, I mean, it, it jumps out at you 99% and then you realize, no, it's 99% excluding, uh, you know, uh, uh, petroleum. But anyway, the main point that is made there that uh, alcohol is one of the main source of revenue of the states is valid. So that's, that, I mean, I, that, that I agree with and I think that should be emphasized. But that is precisely because, uh, and that is precisely why you need to rationalize and have a decent policy regime uh, uh, for, for the, this sector. Uh, another observation I noticed somewhere, there's a remark saying that the demand for alcohol is uh, price inelastic. That also struck me because, you know, a classic textbook case of a product that is actually a luxury good and therefore very sensitive prices is alcohol. So when they, so I, I don't know what the authors meant. Maybe they meant that uh, consumers don't shift from one quality. So it's quality may be price insensitive, not, not the amount of consumption. Now, uh, this is actually quite an important point from a policy perspective, because if tomorrow you want to argue with the states that listen, simply by raising excise duty, you're not going to generate more revenue. Uh, you might actually generate more revenue by lowering your excise rates so that uh, you get, because it's price sensitive, therefore lower rates generate more volume and you might get more revenue. And this brings me to the point that you were raising. You also need to uh, make out a case with the, uh, the central government that just having high tariffs apart from you know, offering protection to domestic producers. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's, it, it's, it encourages lack of competitive behavior. I mean, that's what happened with the trade reforms in 91. As you know, tariffs are brought down drastically. Producers are worried, but then they survived. And uh, uh, Pramod, who is here, he is himself an industrialist, would say that you know, we learn to be competitive globally instead of hiding behind protective trade barriers. But that apart, because uh, these high tariffs feed into inputs and they raise also cost of our domestic uh, production uh, of, of alcohol. And these are the sorts of things you were talking about. How do we become a global player? You know, there are products like Amrut, which is one of the best whiskeys in the world, uh, uh, winning competitions all over. I mean, nobody could believe that India could produce good whiskey. And some of the wines that we are producing are also beginning to uh, get recognition globally, though in very small quantities. Our, uh, one of our rums is, is considered the best rum in the world, even in, in the Caribbean. So it's not the case that India does not have a possibility of having an export product, but we really need to rationalize. I'm not, not talking about the states. I'm talking about our national level tariff policies and tariff lines and so on to to, to be less protective. And as you know, this has often come up in our bilateral and multilateral discussions, trade negotiations and so on, that, you know, uh, about alcohol, uh, the, the tariffs uh, on alcohol. So that is a rationalization that we should uh, really think about and in the next phase uh, of your report. But the main point I wanted to make is that everything uh, that is there in terms of finding of the report actually point you to the direction that if you were to have tomorrow a unified uh, common market for the country as a whole, which is what the GST aspired to do, and then all these problems that you were talking about and you know all the, the discretionary decision making of uh, officials at a particular state level, and then the, the industry and so on, uh, you know, engaging in bribing. I'm not saying that would disappear, but uh, having a transparent uh, national system would take away a lot of these problems. And this is not theoretical. This is what we saw happen when the tariff plans were brought back drastically uh, from something like, you know, in some cases, 150% and so on to 30, 40%. And it really rationalized the market for many products. Alcohol, unfortunately, was not part of it. And the states have a strong interest in staying away from it because they think if they have that flexibility, uh, they can keep playing with excise rates and, and, and raise more revenue. But that's actually not the case. Uh, probably uh, if you had, uh, let's say it's a luxury product, even the 28% is the highest rate you have in your, in your uh, 
GST, different brackets, uh, you might in fact have generate more volume, generate more revenue than you have at you know much higher excise uh, rates. So I just want to stop there. Don't want to monopolize the time, but I wish you well for the next phase of this work. And I do hope you uh, will uh, address some of these issues. I hope that you find these remarks useful. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mandel, uh, for those comments. Uh, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, first uh, Ms. Kapoor to, uh, uh, you know, you could, while making your opening remarks, also respond to the points uh, that have been raised by Mr. Maharishi and uh, uh, Dr. Mandel. And, uh, you know, one is obviously uh, looking at the structural issues that the industry faces. Uh, having to cater to different markets. And so you're literally building a different business for uh, each of the different states and union territories uh, that, that we have. And how do you actually function in a market such as this? And probably at the back end, there's an overall balance sheet that, that is uh, kind of being worked out to look at numbers in India on an overall basis. And obviously... Uh, uh, price considerations at different places, you win some and you lose some and it's an averaging out that you do as a business. Uh, and what you feel uh, regulators and other stakeholders could necessarily contribute to bring some sense into this market uh, moving forward. So uh, thank you, Aditya. And uh, do me a favor, if I miss out any of your an answering your questions, please point them out to you because I do intend to answer most of them, if not all, given the time discipline. So first and foremost, uh, with respect to Mr. Maharishi, uh, this is exactly what new professionals like us coming into this sector are trying to correct. This mindset that let's paint everybody and all stakeholders in this sector as criminals is something that the sector needs to kind of address and professionals in this sector need to take into account, number one. Number two is if this sector is perpetually going to be talking about itself, about its past and about its malaise and about its leakages, then I think India overall is going to lose the opportunity and the potential that this sector can offer, albeit that it does its business in a compliant and in a responsible manner. That's one. So that's my fundamental response to that. I certainly am absolutely well-educated like all of us here, and I have no intentions to have any criminal uh, aspersions cast on my experience, number one. Number two, I totally agree with Dr. Munde to say that let's look at what is the progressive nature of this industry going to be. And therefore, what is really required for this industry going forward? So here's what, you know, when I, when I read the tweet of our prime minister, I was delighted because what did the prime minister tweet? And I'll quote the tweet and he said this so in, on 24th of Feb, that government has no business to be in business. And that's what our prime minister said. And he clarified to say, it is the government's duty to support enterprises and businesses, but it is not essential that it should own and run these enterprises. And this is the starting point of the malaise of the alcohol beverage industry. The current business models of all the 30 states, you've taken into account 10, I'm adding another 20 to that, all the 30 states, it's actually the business model is addressing the law of diminishing returns. Because the person and the most important stakeholder is essentially only and only interested in maximizing the revenue. And that look is so short-sighted that it only depends on his tenure. There are conversations on the table that say, I'm not going to be here next year. So therefore, when Dr. Munde says that it is the quality that is essentially getting influence, he's absolutely right. Maximizing of revenues is downtrading the industry. So what are you doing as far as your social objectives and your social responsibility is concerned? Today, if you look at it, and it's been quoted in the report, multiple states have a phenomenal share of country liquor. What manufacturing best practices are we talking about? What quality standards are we talking about? What conservation and, emotion and, and environmental processes are we, are we talking about? So what are you doing? 
in a way you are now going back to what the industry would have been some three decades ago. Let me look at my maximization. Let me look at what my uh, revenue for that year is going to be. And to that an extent, uh, Maharishi ji is right. Consumer, who is talking about the consumer? Who is talking about drink less, drink quality, be responsible, look at how you consume your alcohol, difference between alcohol and alcoholism. Why? Why aren't these subjects coming up? And I'm so glad Mr. Basin said so at the onset. Why is alcohol beverage being put behind the, under the carpet? It is a social drink. It's a social interface. It needs to be handled that way. Why do we always add the nuances of, of corruption to this sector? For what? 1.5 million jobs? Look at the export potential. When we are talking export potential, we start looking at, oh, international players, domestic players, classic Indian debate, classic Indian debate. When it needs to be defeated, it is to be say India as a total has export potential. You spoke about a few brands being exported. There are many multinational local brands also being exported. It's a huge opportunity. Look at it collectively. Give up the colonial mindsets. Open up the sector. Now, when you look at the consumer, I'll give you an example. Under 35, and I'm sure the next round of report, and this is what I stated at the onset also when we were chatting informally, was this. The under 35 consumer is essentially looking for low alcohol content products, right? What is our excise policy doing about that? Nothing. It goes by content. It goes by only the browns and treats everybody else in the same manner. Look at the way the cost structures are being handled. When we are talking about leakages and exports, the states are playing arbitrage amongst themselves. Hello. There is nobody else. The states are doing it and they all know that they are doing it. If you are asking a supplier... Give me a lowest average on, my, on the distillery price. What are you asking? That I ignore your cost in implications. I ignore the inflation. I ignore the quality processes. Compromise on that, but give me the lowest distillery price. What does that imply? So when, I, when I'm saying that, look, this is happening. The law of diminishing returns has set in. Maximization of revenues is done. What next now? So that is when, when Dr. Munde talked about it to say, what should the progressive taxation be? The market is a uniform market. Trust you me. I've been in the FMCG sector for 30 years. The market is uniform. It is how the states are managing a competitive, what I call competitive forces through excise games for maximization of state revenue is making it into 30 markets. The consumer is uniform. There is a demand there. But what is he seeking? What does he want? Am I dovetailing it or my policy is RK? My excise is in anywhere ranging between 50 to 100 years old. Why? Why haven't I moved with the times? Why won't I move with the times? These are the questions that I, I'm posing it back and I'm saying yes to that an extent. The report is absolutely on spot to bring out the challenges, right? It's also offering solutions and believe you me, Mr. Basin will agree with me to remove corruption to remove opacity, there is nothing better than technology. Those states that have adopted the EAPKARI format of, 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 uh, <coughs> of platforms, look at where they are going. Those states which have eliminated country liquor, see the revenue growth of the southern states. See the structure of the industry in those southern states. See the quality that's available in those states, right? Those states that have given the freedom of retail distribution, do you know this is the only country that has a popular, that has a total outlet of 80,000 for 1.3 billion people? You're talking about one outlet, a lakh. So what are you going to expect? 
you're going to expect illegal, you're going to expect spurious, you're going to expect this. Why? Whose decisions are these? Whose decisions are these? So to, they, they, this is, these are some of my answers. Now, how are the players managing it? What is the, what are, you know, is my members doing? What do we do? What can we do? So we keep an eye on the consumer. We keep an eye on the aspirations. We keep an eye and say long-term quality, long-term premiumization is that's what you need to go. If you look at our excise representations in every presentation that I am making and, and seeking with the state government, what am I saying? Rationalize. Do not discriminate. Grade your excise. Let the volume grow. Don't push it into country liquor. Get responsible. Collaborate with us on responsible drinking. These are some of the top 10 points that every document in every state representation is talking about. Home delivery, take the, take the, take the fear away from women. Yeah, deliver it at home, deliver it safely, deliver it legally. Look at e-commerce platforms. Why are you so concerned about the vested interest who do not want to let go of the control of the industry? Why? And when we are ready to talk openly, then why would you always refer to us about what happened 10 years ago in the industry? My consumer, me going forward, new professionals coming in this sector are not interested. We want, don't want to look back. We want to look forward. So I hope I haven't consumed all of my time. I'll save some for the other panel members. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Kapoor. Uh, I mean, I think you've touched upon some important uh, questions on categorization, pricing, delinking, looking at uh, input uh, costs, uh, etc. And how we don't look at this as a holistic market, but obviously that's the structural issue that we face here, that you have multiple markets. Uh, Mr. Giri, I'd like you to uh, also, when you come in with your comments, and uh, uh, since you uh, represent a large chunk of the industry as well, uh, focus on uh, some of these issues that have been raised by the other speakers and uh, would also like uh, you to provide inputs on what you believe is required of states or uh, the state in a sense uh, or governments to be to enable uh, India to become a manufacturing hub uh, uh, and to become uh, somebody uh, that can improve uh, our export potential in this sector while we look at uh, sorting out our internal issues uh, and our internal markets uh, in this country. Yeah, thanks, uh, Suhan. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Well, first of all, I would... Uh... Uh, thank uh, Preksha, right? Because she made me younger by a few years, so that's that's great. And if Mr. Marishi is here, because uh, still Lovely. on the panel, because I remember him most from the uh, the Rajasthan days, where he was actually one of the most progressive uh, uh, secretaries or officials. Uh, I will stick to the report. And because that's the context and then the specific questions you have asked, I'll try and address them. Uh, first of all, I think it's a great effort to put this report together. A lot of information has been put in one place and uh, which is uh, uh, great because that's one reference point for us. Um, there's a lot of market data is there. Uh, the summary of the barriers, I think, is absolutely right. And the way forward in terms of direction is, uh, is absolutely right. Um, there, there are some factual inaccuracies. Uh, some of these have been raised, mentioned by people. I would not go too much into that detail because as long as the direction is right and there's some information would be there. And as uh, frequently pointed out was about the percentages uh, I think Mr. Marishi put that in the right context. It's, uh, uh, it's actually about 15 to 30% of the state's own revenues, which is keeping the GST out. And uh, uh, so, but the important point is it is, a, it is a very significant part of the state government's revenues. 
and uh, so that's there are some issues which raised which i was also unclear about uh, uh, this is first is uh, uh, the consultation before the report or before for this research uh, we were not consulted earlier so a significant part of the industry probably voice was not heard uh, it's not that we expect to be consulted for every report, but probably would have added more value if uh, uh, we knew about this uh, research being undertaken. Uh, the things which I find, uh, and other part Mr. Marishi raised uh, right in the beginning, uh, it helps to understand the context of a research. And one of the important thing being uh, in a very straightforward way who is paying for it. Because then we know that uh, 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 what we are getting into and what kind of uh, uh, the flavor for the information which may be there in the report. But I'll keep that aside because there's a lot of value for the report to add. There are a few things I want to specifically point out, uh, which is I think uh, one is the, the issue of price inelasticity raised. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that data. And again, I'm highlighting that only because uh, earlier as the uh, uh, Dr. Mandel mentioned that this is important from the policy making point of view. Uh, if we have sufficient data to indicate that, and we saw that during the last COVID times, when we did a study on uh, linking the percentage increase in the taxation and hence pricing along uh, with the sales, sales volume. And we realized that there is a, uh, beyond a point, up to a point, you can take, the consumers can take the price increases, which is by and large little, you know, plus minus 5% from the inflation rate. Beyond that, you start seeing the impact of the price increase coming on the volume. Number two, there is also down trading happens, which does not show in the total volume, but actually the value of the sales start declining. So there is, alcohol is price elastic. It's not price inelastic. And that's important from the policy point of view. Two is, I think there is a, uh, excessive focus on the uh, the tariff part in this report. Uh, I think by and large, India is a domestic market. If you look at any segment, any sector is a domestic market and that's what drives the economy. That's what isolates us from the rest of the world. So sometimes when the rest of the world is feeling the pinch, we don't feel because this is the way the economy is. Uh, and we should, the reality is that uh, uh, the interest, there would be interest for the rest of the world to look at this market, like in alcohol, also like in all the other segments. And the government policy should be in line with how we look at other sectors and not specifically pick out that uh, we have to open up this sector or what we need to do exports. I think excessive focus when the exports are, just to give a, uh, just a reference point, a total of about 2,50,000 crores of the taxation, taxes that the sector pays. Total import duties are about 5,000 crores only. So it's very small, this thing. And, uh, so the domestic nature of Indian market is important. Uh, and all the tariff discussion, which you touch upon in the report at one point of time, uh, is that issue of the non-tariff barriers. They also play equally important role. Uh, that any discussion and debate has to happen about creating a level playing field for both the importers and exporters and all these factors have to be considered. And the NTBs you normally don't see so clearly because the discussion remains around tariff, which is a very quantifiable number. Uh, but there are very strong NTBs being put up by some of the Western countries. But that I'll leave out as a, a matter for a separate discussion, not specific to the report. Now, coming back to the the context of any policy making and uh, uh, the things we have to bear in mind is uh, the state's dependence on alcohol revenues. And uh, which also means that there is an element of risk averseness uh, about no one wants to take chances, no one wants to jeopardize this revenue. So the reforms are you see often very patchy and there's a very bolt on a manner, and you don't see any sweeping reforms, large-scale reforms happening because of the risk factor. Two, there is an increasing element of mistrust between the state and the center. So which has the earlier hope of moving on towards a more uniform and standardized policy is 
diminishing at least in the near future. And as things, as someone just mentioned, a lot of policy making is, you know, crystal gazing into future, which I agree. But in the foreseeable future, that is a big barrier uh, coming up. And we also are seeing the debate on the GST on ENA, which is right now the GST council is caught up with. So those issues are there. Third is there's a states have a very limited uh, alternatives uh, and uh, to this revenue, which means there is a desire to control this industry, and uh, there's a there's a I call it a notion of being a brain waves of excise authorities sometimes because they believe they're going to earn revenues and brownie points because this is the biggest source of revenue they have these days, especially. So we see a lot of uh, uh, policy making which is very ad hoc in nature and. Uh, and we sometimes we question the logic behind it. It's being done in silos. So the governments don't talk to each other. So someone looks and, and most of the time, in fact, we there as the industry bodies and the companies, we tend to inform the state governments about what other states are doing. And there's no way of sharing this information and knowledge. Uh, so that's, that's a problem with the policy making. And there is also, uh, we heard quite some speakers talk, Dr. Maharshi also talking about it. There's a mistrust between the government and the industry, number one. Uh, a lot of it is legacy issues. A uh, lot of it is uh, uh, maybe justified, may not be justified. Perception is reality. That's how the regulators sometimes believe. There's also a lot of vested interest. I mean, let's not discount them, which means uh, and I'm not without saying anything, it can go up the highest level in a, in a government, so which means, and all of this goes to form this absence of common vision. So it's not like a NASCOM, for example, can go and speak to the government and talk about this is our vision, let's share journey. Here we struggle with that. We are unable to develop a common vision because the fundamental trust is missing between the government and the industry. The that also brings the element of profiteering in policy. And I'm saying profiteering in policy making, the government looks at, and I've been part of some government meetings where the government say, the senior government authorities, let's talk about yourself and ourselves. Consumers is irrelevant. They're not supposed to drink. It's states is supposed to have prohibition. So let's see how you make some money and how we government on revenue. So profiteering is a become an element where the government also looks at it. Some of the industry members also look at it. So, and so all this is the context which sets up. So we, when, while uh, we going forward, I mean, we of course cannot live in this forever. So I think we have, uh, we need to work out the, any model that we talk about in regulation. Uh, first of all, we need to factor in the state's preeminence. Uh, in the foreseeable future, let's realize state will be the preeminent authority, state governments. So that is our pillar number one. We also need to be far more data backed and uh, uh, where we share information, we cascade more information and we share and be upfront about it. We need to be transparent ourselves. We share information with the, uh, with the governments. Uh, we need to be fair also. Sometimes we are also driven by everyone. The government is driven by their own short-term uh, incentives. Industry also sometimes looks at the short-term incentive. We need to be fair saying what is the long-term health of the industry as well as of the government and other stakeholders like consumers because uh, uh, long-term benefit, long-term stakes of all of us are same. To me, a very important part of the policy making going forward is to simplify things. It's so complex and I cannot, any person coming new to the industry, and that's one of the things I admire for the research makers. Uh, and uh, uh, Nita is also new to the industry and I'll, she will go through this now. The sheer complexity certainly. is phenomenal and it's multiplied state by state. And the MRP formulas are calculated sometimes. You go to the MRP, come back and calculate the excise duty. It's, it's <laughs> ridiculous, the level of complication. I mean, we need to simplify like any consumer product. There should be, this is, here is your basic billing price. Here are the taxes, here are the margins as the consumer price, as simple as that. Um, also all the pricing and taxes in my view, and uh, that's where uh, somewhere in your report, you also, I believe become self-contradictory. Uh, they should be devoid of any social agenda that the market determine. 
uh, the government should not drive, try to drive, okay, let me encourage this, let me discourage that. There's a market at play. You allow the manufacturers the freedom to pursue the policies they want. Let them decide on how they want to invest behind their brand, whether into pricing, whether into promotion, marketing, whatever, like any other FMCG product does. So we need to simplify things. We need to collapse a lot of these multiple taxation, multiple regulations into few. And that will make life easy for everyone. And let this be driven by the market. And uh, any model also, I believe, has to be a plus plus, which means no point recommendation, recommending anything to a government where they lose revenues. For them, it has to be revenue plus uh, and politically sellable. If it's not, neither of the governments will not do. And there are all a lot of nice voices we'll hear, but it will not happen. For industry, it's all about ease of operations, uh, predictability of the policy making, and there should be sufficient reward because if the company industry doesn't make money, why should they be in business? And uh, the final thing is, of course, we should all work towards making it more standard across the country as standard as possible. It's a long journey, but hopefully as the government starts sharing information with each other and part of cross pollination should be played by the, done by the industry. There are, I think, some is very low-hanging fruits, and there's a long list, but the low-hanging fruits are, to me, is a, one is digitization, which is moving away from this physical control. And I've seen this industry for the last 20 years, off and on. I've seen the element of physical control used to be there. Now, at least because of COVID and because of the government focus on digitization, we are moving to a, increasingly towards a more uh, online of, say, off person controls, which to me is a very good progress. We still have, it's, it's hard to believe that we still have in Maharashtra to ship, we need to have a physical person accompanying every truck. That's so ridiculous in the day of technology when every truck can be tracked every step of its, uh, every mile of its journey, but a physical person has to accompany you. So we need to move away from, these are easy ones. We need to get into a, a more data backed simplification for the pricing and tax, uh, we need to have the procedures where we start mitigating the risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, third, I think it's a very important thing. We need to start breaking silos between the states so that they also understand the good practices are shared across states. Uh, specific to Suhan, you mentioned about how do we build larger export base in India? I think one of the fundamental things for that is we need to allow companies to have scale of production. Today, because of the interstate uh, restrictions, it's so difficult to build large plants here. And I've been in beer industry. I remember my struggle to make even a one, one and a half hectoliter, a million hectoliter plant, how much struggle it was at that time. Whereas a large, in, typically in US, our plant used to be at 16, 18 million hectoliters. That's a, so we have struggled with creating scale there because of interstate restrictions are there. Industrial licensing, licensing is, uh, is difficult. The labor laws also are questionable. You go beyond a point and you start struggling with the labor laws. So whereas the large factories which supply to the whole world are massive plants where really they drive the efficiencies of scale. So to me, scale of production, removing interstate restrictions is vital to create any efficiency in production in the country. So that's, I mean, I won't take much time. That's my top line view on the report. In summary, I think very good report. There are some inaccuracies, but it happens in a report of this kind. There's no problem. The direction is absolutely right. Uh, as we go, some the points I mentioned, which are important to me were price inelasticity was uh, something that I think we need to correct because that would lead the governments in the wrong direction. Um, and then we can talk about specifics view. I won't get into detail because I have all flaps put into, I have highlighted your report in <laughs> so many pages. I won't get into that at this stage. So that in summary is my view on the, on yeah. the report. And it's also very nice to meet Neeta. I can't believe it's the first time I'm seeing you. And that's online. It's a catch pleasure. You for coffee. Save your catch you for coffee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Giri. Well uh, actually, well given said. that yeah. you've raised this uh, inelasticity, elasticity yeah. issue has been raised by everyone. Arpita, maybe you could respond in 30 seconds to this comment uh, 
that has been raised by all of the panelists uh, on this uh, point of inelasticity. And then we can take the questions that have come in from some of the audience. I noticed somebody from Tamil Nadu, one of the government agencies has asked a question to two of the panelists. But uh, Preksha, you can shift to that after Arpita responds. Arpita? Yes. Uh, the answer is actually in the question, because if I don't have a consumer data and if I haven't done a consumer survey, then I may have not done the price elasticity or inelasticity at all. So in any report, you have to give a literature review. And we gave a literature review of the earlier studies which talk about price elasticity and inelasticity. And if you read it carefully, it is not our study. But I don't know why we have brought in other people people study into our study, uh, that is the path I don't know. I completely agree with uh, Sudipta Mandal's comment, Rajiv Narish's comment, and that brings me to the Nita's comment that, you know, there has to be a consumer survey. Now, we, Mr. Giri, it is not always that I will go to you. It is sometimes you industry association like yours have to come to India's top ranking think tanks like us to ask you to tell you how to do things. You have to fund research. Now, if you don't fund research and keep on crying that we did not go to you, it's, I think, very unfair. And, and then you need to actually start now, uh, now that you have raised this point, I would like you to fund the research on these points and see that if you're doing the job or not. Because, you know, you can't expect everything we can do from our grant money, which Suhan has rightly pointed out. Uh, coming to Sudipto's question, we have already discussed bilaterally on it, that we need a 10 years data. And there is a question read by Tamil Nadu also on that in the chat box. We need a 10 years long data. We do not have a three year data. Because you don't have a data, you go and ask everybody and every state, give me the data. So if you do not capture a data or allow a yearly survey to capture the data, this will not happen. But we are very happy to work with you. We are happy to do the survey. I completely agree with Nita that the, and that's why I gave the Scotland example, not because I wanted a Scotland model in India, but I said that it started with capturing the consumers. You have to capture what your consumer demand is because if you do not look at what they want to drink you cannot go it from the other side and that will capture your wine market your beer market and all the other questions now fit well into it i hope i answer the queries and questions uh, thanks arpita uh, preksha if you could take some of the questions that have come in from uh, the audience that yes. have been directed to the and direct them to the panelists uh, sure Okay, so there's one question which is directed to Ms., uh, to Dr. Mandri, which says that should a state want to consider such evidence-based policy making, what are the initial steps one should take? Also, what should be the ideal review period once such policy is put into place? Uh, who has the question come from? I think you can give some context uh, on that as well so that uh, the discussant can answer it. Yeah. Actually, I've already responded in the chat, and that's what okay. uh, Arpita was referring to. I have responded, she reacted, I responded to her. So we've already dealt with it Okay. okay. in the chat. Uh, well, that may not be available to the, the entire audience uh, that's actually listening in. So uh, okay. perhaps if you can uh, articulate it here, then yeah. Well, basically, this gentleman uh, was asking what would be the starting point for evidence-based policy making. <clears throat> and I said that they needed data on uh, prices, excess duties and outcomes in terms of what it uh, did to uh, quantities sold and sales and so forth. And Ar Arpita uh, uh, mentioned that maybe 10 years data and so on, and I agreed with her. That was the discussion. Okay, so uh, so I think it actually uh, underscores the point that the main thrust of the report, which is that you need in order to uh, frame good policy, uh, you actually need a lot of data points and a lot of data to be collected uh, in various with regard to the sector. If you have to shape a rational policy uh, in a sense, and I think that's been one of the principal themes uh, of the report and. Uh, Maybe uh, Mr. Giri will help us on the second phase at some point with the consumer survey. 
uh, on looking at that. But uh, while putting in a plug for that, uh, Preksha, you can go in uh, with regard to the response to the next question. Okay. The next question is, um, can you please highlight some of the global trends that you have identified in your report that can be adapted as part of the best global practices, which can be adapted here in India? Okay. Uh, uh, would one any of the authors like to respond to that? Or if uh, Ms. Kapoor or Mr. Giri, do, if you all have any thoughts about where you, some of the global best practices that you think uh, should be brought in here into India. Uh. Uh, okay, so uh, let me ra uh, raise, uh, let me answer the report part of it and then I leave it to Nita. Uh, see, global best practices, uh, see, price control measures globally actually is a bit historic because initially WHO and others who were looking into health impact used to talk about, you know, any unhealthy product increase the price. But later the global studies found that, you know, the price is not the right means of controlling consumption. It can be that if the price increases, you know, uh, you shift to poor quality products, so on and so forth. So there are other measures. One measure is the, what Nita already said is about responsible consumption, how you guide your consumers and consumer take decisions that I should not be having these kind of products. I may actually minimize my drink, uh, uh, not, not, you know, and, and look at my balance of my desire and my health impact. That's how they present it. The second thing is that you also look at something called product premiumization and product quality. And as you come out with new products, you are innovating your product. Product premiumization has been very important for tax guidance because then you move into a quality indicator and when the quality indicator is good, then you tax the product less. And, and you also, sometimes that can be that the quality is a premium price, like, you know, or organic food may be having a higher price than the conventional food products, but still the consumers are going in for that uh, product premiumization. So these are the things that we talked about from the global experience and then the panel can take over. Thanks, Arpita. Right. If uh, Nita uh, or Vinod, if you'd like to respond to right. that, and so I'd, I'd, like just, you to I'd also like you to touch upon categorization and that issue. Uh, if that and there should there be a delinking uh, or decoupling of that uh, with excise right. policy? Yeah. So right, I think I'll add, and then Vinod can also join. Uh, is one is uh, one of the best practices is in terms of the quality checks. Uh, that is one. Second is in terms of technology, right from the sip to the to the table or to the to the, to the to the glass. There is completely technology involved there. The way I. So from, from all stakeholders, from the government, from the supplier, from the, from the distributor to the end consumer. This is what we are missing. Third is the world has moved towards e-commerce and the pandemic has only, an, you know, kind of deepened that uh, move. Whereas we are still locked in as far as our distribution is concerned. Because you've seen that the more you suppress the more it's going to find different ways of reaching out. And those could be incorrect and harmful and illegal ways. So for me, technology plays a very, very integral part in addition to what uh, Arpita has just talked about, which is product innovations uh, that, that will go hand in hand. And lastly is responsible drinking is not in our country, I, I, you know, and. This is something we need to address collectively in a responsible manner is to say, accept it openly. And this is what COVID taught us. When those progressive states that allowed for home delivery, the barriers or the erstwhile resistance have, have melted. And perhaps maybe, you know, it's, it will bring down the so-called sinful categorization of alcohol beverage. To your point, in terms of wines, I know compared to the uh, to the brown, uh, which is essentially whiskey domination, the wines is insignificant. But like Maharishi ji pointed out, hey, it's still twenty percent, right? And uh, we should we should look at that. We should look at the light uh, but light beverages too. So these are some of the points I'll add. But like I like Arpita said, with consumer nuances 
with information, with data, with projections to see whether a nuanced excise policy will deliver the re revenues back to the government is like what we know said, your primary stakeholder is the government. And you cannot have a proposal that is really going to kind of reduce his, his earnings, right? So everything needs to be taken care of in, in uh, keeping that also in mind. So we know, yeah. please add to this. No, I, I, it's a, one thing I can say, and I've been someone I have run large businesses across Europe and America. Um, it's a best practice is a very wide term. It's almost impossible to say where do you want to apply best practice. Uh, countries work differently and they all respond to their local context. So uh, Canada works uh, pretty much a government controlled, whereas the neighboring US works very differently on pretty much a federal style. Uh, they all have their own sort of best practice in pricing and taxation, a very complex subject. I think we'll have to look at our own context and everyone has to evolve their own pricing and taxation structure. To me, the overall, the best practices are when you simplify things and make it easy for everyone to implement. Uh, the easier it is to implement, the better the implementation is always. Uh, so all this structure, taxes, and pricing should be very simple uh, and uh, implementable easily to ensure high compliance. I do not quite agree with what Dr. Um, Arpita Mukherjee said earlier. Driving consumer behavior to a particular direction is through policy making is uh, something always a questionable area uh, because you never know when the state is going to cross line. If you start inviting state into that, that do drive a particular kind of behavior by doing your tax regulation, that's a wrong thing. It's somewhere you reach the journey of what you can eat, what you cannot eat. Then the, you are inviting state into privation, privating this and all. Best is let the market decide what they want to do. Every, the competitors should be, it should be a simple regulation, uh, a point with the, which just uh, Nita brought up, say, which is bring it out under the sunlight, make it open, make it easy, and the, the market will determine itself. The good quality products will always be, in the long term, they will always be preferred by the consumers. And uh, consumers are fairly clever. At the end of the day, if you give them enough choice, they know what to pick up and what to buy. So the one is best practice has to be in the Indian context. There's uh, any international best practice has to be adapted for India. Uh, by and large, the best tax regimes in the world are simple tax regimes where people follow the, people can easily understand and implement it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mandal, do you have any closing comments? Uh, we've got a couple of minutes more uh, on looking at what should be this uh, federal, uh, I mean, a federal approach from a government of India perspective, or how should the states move to work together to create some scale in this uh, in this sector, along with the private sector? What would be uh, prudent from an economic planning perspective? Well, one thing that has come out, I think everybody in this uh, discussion has said that you need transparency, uh, simplicity, predictability of policy, and so on. Now, these are wonderful goal. We know that that's not going to happen overnight. But I think if you have that as your end, I mean, and to me, that would be essentially bringing alcohol under the coverage of GST. We all know it's not going to happen, but you have that in mind as an eventual goal, then you can nudge the states towards, first of all, neighboring states getting their act together in making uniform policies and so on. And certainly, bringing IT into the picture, as has been said in your report, uh, already takes care of a lot of that problem. Because if you start doing you know, things online, uh, a lot of this discretionary uh, pricing, excise duties, and so on, uh, just to wither away. So let Got me thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, Preksha, I'll hand it back to you to uh, close the uh, session and the program, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would now request Angana to please give out the vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, very good evening, everyone. Uh, as a co-author uh, of this report, I take immense pleasure uh, to deliver the vote of thanks for today's event. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the support of Dr. Deepak Mishra, our director for this study. And thank you, Mr. Bhasin, for releasing this report and for your continuous support and encouragement. 
We are grateful to our distinguished panel of speakers for today's session, Ms. Neeta Kapoor, Mr. Rajiv Maharishi, Dr. Sudipto Mandal, and Mr. Vinod Giri. Your expertise and diverse knowledge on the subject would definitely help in creating a discourse on the need for a transparent and evidence-based policymaking in the alcoholic beverages sector. My sincere thanks goes out to Mr. Suhan Mukherjee for uh, moderating today's panel discussion and providing us the opportunity to collaborate on this very pertinent subject. I and my co-authors would like to thank the survey participants and experts for significantly contributing towards this study and Mr. Sangu Kapila of Academic Foundation for releasing this report. The representatives of the industry and the state policymakers deserve a special mention for their valuable inputs. We hope that with their continued support, we can move on to the second phase of the study. Uh, the event would not have been possible without the huge team behind it. So I'd like to thank the entire event management, IT and communication team at Geller Chambers and ICREA for organizing technical support and coordinating this entire event. Last but not the least, I'd li like to thank all the uh, participants uh, who have been here with us today for the release and the panel discussion and have made the event even more engaging. Uh, you may order a copy of this report uh, through the website of the Academic Foundation or you can email Chaya Singh uh, of ICREA. Uh, the, the details are mentioned in the chat box. And uh, once again, I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much.